Section 24 of Select Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit. Select Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. Section 24. Hypocrites Deficient in the Duty of Prayer, Part 1 Job 27, verse 10 Will he always call upon God? Concerning these words I would observe. 1. Who it is that is here spoken of, viz. the hypocrite. As you may see, if you take the two preceding verses with the verse of the text, for what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained when God taketh away his soul? Will God bear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? Job's three friends, in their speeches to him, insisted much upon it, that he was an hypocrite. But Job, in this chapter, asserts his sincerity and integrity, and shows how different his own behavior had been from that of hypocrite. Particularly, he declares his steadfast and immovable resolution of persevering and holding out in the ways of religion and righteousness to the end, as you may see in the six first verses. In the text, he shows how contrary to his steadfastness and perseverance the character of the hypocrite is, who is not wont thus to hold out in religion. 2. We may observe what duty of religion it is with respect to which the hypocrite is deciphered in the text, and that is the duty of prayer or calling upon God. 3. Here is something supposed of the hypocrite relating to his duty, viz., that he may continue in it for a while, he may call upon God for a season. 4. Something asserted, viz., that it is not the manner of hypocrites to continue always in this duty. Will he always call upon God? It is in the form of an interrogation. But the words have the force of a strong negation, or of an assertion, that however the hypocrite may call upon God for a season, yet he will not always continue in it. Doctrine However hypocrites may continue for a season in the duty of prayer, yet it is their manner, after a while, in a great measure, to leave it off. In speaking upon this doctrine I shall show. 1. How hypocrites often continue for a season to call upon God. 2. How it is their manner, after a while, in a great measure to leave off the practice of this duty. 3. Give some reasons why this is the manner of hypocrites. 1. I would show how hypocrites often continue for a season in the duty of prayer. First, they do so for a while after they have received common illuminations and affections. While they are under awakenings, they may, through fear of hell, call upon God and attend very constantly upon the duty of secret prayer and after they have had some melting affections, having their hearts much moved with the goodness of God, or with some affecting encouragements and false joy and comfort. While these impressions last, they continue to call upon God in the duty of secret prayer. Second, after they have obtained an hope, and have made profession of their good estate, they often continue for a while in the duty of secret prayer. For a while they are affected with their hope. They think that God hath delivered them out of a natural condition, and given them an interest in Christ, thus introducing them into a state of safety from that eternal misery which they lately feared. With this supposed kindness of God to them, they are much affected, and often find in themselves for a while a kind of love to God, excited by His supposed love to them. Now while this affection towards God continues, the duties of religion seem pleasant to them, 
It is even with some delight that they approach to God in their closets, and for the present it may be they think of no other than continuing to call upon God as long as they live. Yea, they may continue in the duty of secret prayer for a while after the liveliness of their affections is past, partly through the influence of their former intentions. They intended to continue seeking God always, and now suddenly to leave off would therefore be too shocking to their own minds, and partly through the force of their own preconceived notions, and what they have always believed, viz., that godly persons do continue in religion, and that their goodness is not like the morning cloud. Therefore, though they have no love to the duty of prayer, and begin to grow weary of it, yet as they love their own hope, they are somewhat backward to take a course which will prove it to be a false hope, and so deprive them of it. If they should at once carry themselves, so as they have always been taught is a sign of false hope, they would scare themselves. Their hope is dear to them, and it would scare them to see any plain evidence that it is not true. Hence, for a considerable time, after the force of their illuminations and affections is over, and after they hate the duty of prayer, and would be glad to have done with it, if they could, without showing themselves to be hypocrites, they hold up a kind of attendance upon the duty of secret prayer. This may keep up the outside of religion in them for a good while, and occasion it to be somewhat slowly that they are brought to neglect it. They must not leave off suddenly, because that would be too great a shock to their false peace, but they must come gradually to it, as they find their consciences can bear it, and as they can find out devices and salvos to cover over the matter, and make their so doing consistent in their own opinion with the truth of their hope. But, too, it is the manner of hypocrites, after a while, in a great measure, to leave off the practice of this duty. We are often taught that the seeming goodness and piety of hypocrites is not of a lasting and persevering nature. It is so with respect to their practice of the duty of prayer in particular, and especially of secret prayer. They can omit this duty, and their omission of it not be taken notice of by others, who know what profession they have made, so that a regard to their own reputation doth not oblige them still to practice it. If others saw how they neglect it, it would exceedingly shock their charity towards them. But their neglect doth not fall under their observation, at least not under the observation of many. Therefore they may omit this duty, and still have the credit of being converted persons." Men of this character can come to a neglect of secret prayer by degrees without very much shocking their peace. For though indeed for a converted person to live in a great measure without secret prayer is very wide of the notion they once had of a true convert, yet they find means by degrees to alter their notions and to bring their principles to suit with their inclinations. And at length they come to that, in their notions of things, that a man may be a convert, and yet live very much in neglect of this duty. In time they can bring all things to suit well together, and hope of heaven, and an indulgence of sloth in gratifying carnal appetites, and living in a great measure a prayerless life. They cannot indeed suddenly make these things agree. It must be a work of time, and length of time will effect it. By degrees they find out ways to guard and defend their conscience against those powerful enemies, so that those enemies and a quiet, secure conscience can at length dwell pretty well together. Whereas it is asserted in the doctrine that it is the manner of hypocrites after a while, in a great measure, to leave off this duty, I would observe to you, first, that it is not intended but that they may commonly continue to the end of life in yielding an external attendance on open prayer or prayer with others. They may commonly be present at public prayers in the congregation, and also at family prayer. This, in such places of light as this is, men commonly do before ever they are so much as awakened. Many vicious persons, who make no pretense to serious religion, 
commonly attend public prayers in the congregation, and also more private prayers in the families in which they live, unless it be when carnal designs interfere, or when their youthful pleasures and diversions and their vain company call them, and then they make no conscience of attending family prayer. Otherwise they may continue to attend upon prayer as long as they live, and yet may truly be said not to call upon God. For such prayer, in the manner of it, is not their own. They are present only for the sake of their credit, or in compliance with others. They may be present at these prayers, and yet have no proper prayer of their own. Many of those concerning whom it may be said, as in Job 15, verse 4, that they cast off fear and restrain prayer before God, are yet frequently present at family and public prayer. Second, but they in a great measure leave off the practice of secret prayer. They come to this pass by degrees. At first they begin to be careless about it under some particular temptations. Because they have been out in young company or have been taken up very much with worldly business, they omit it once. After that they more easily omit it again. Thus it presently becomes a frequent thing with them to omit it, and after a while it comes to that pass that they seldom attend it. Perhaps they attend it on Sabbath days, and sometimes on other days, but they have ceased to make it a constant practice daily to retire to worship God alone, and to seek His face in secret places. They sometimes do a little to quiet conscience, and just to keep alive their old hope because it would be shocking to them, even after all their subtle dealing with their consciences, to call themselves converts, and yet totally to live without prayer. Yet the practice of secret prayer they have in a great measure left off. I come now, three, to the reasons why this is the manner of hypocrites. First, hypocrites never had the spirit of prayer given them. They may have been stirred up to the external performance of this duty, and that with a great deal of earnestness and affection, and yet always have been destitute of the true spirit of prayer. The spirit of prayer is an holy spirit, a gracious spirit. We read of the spirit of grace and supplication, Zechariah 3, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. Wherever there is a true spirit of supplication, there is the spirit of grace. The true spirit of prayer is no other than God's own spirit dwelling in the hearts of the saints. And as this spirit comes from God, so doth it naturally tend to God in holy breathings and pantings. It naturally leads to God, to converse with Him by prayer. Therefore the Spirit is said to make intercession for the saints with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8, verse 26. But it is far otherwise with the true convert. His work is not done, but he finds still a great work to do, and great wants to be supplied. He sees himself still to be a poor, empty, helpless creature, and that he still stands in great and continual need of God's help. He is sensible that without God he can do nothing. A false conversion makes a man in his own eyes self-sufficient. He saith he is rich, and increased with goods, and hath need of nothing, and knoweth not that he is wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. But after a true conversion the soul remains sensible of its own impotence and emptiness, as it is in itself and its sense of it is rather increased than diminished. It is still sensible of its universal dependence on God for everything. A true convert is sensible that his grace is very imperfect, and he is very far from having all that he desires. Instead of that, by conversion are begotten in him new desires which he never had before. He now finds in him holy appetites, and hungering and thirsting after righteousness, a longing after more acquaintance and communion with God, so that he hath business enough still at the throne of grace, yea, his business there, instead of being diminished, 
is, since his conversion, rather increased. Third, the hope which the hypocrite hath of his good estate takes off the force that the command of God before had upon his conscience, so that now he dares neglect so plain a duty. The command which requires the practice of the duty of prayer is exceeding plain. Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Ephesians 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Matthew 6, verse 6. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. As long as the hypocrite was in his own apprehension, in continual danger of hell, he durst not disobey these commands. But since he is, as he thinks, safe from hell, he is grown bold. He dares to live in the neglect of the plainest command in the Bible. Fourth, it is the manner of hypocrites, after a while, to return to sinful practices, which will tend to keep them from praying. While they were under convictions, they reformed their lives, and walked very exactly. This reformation continues for a little time, perhaps, after their supposed conversion, while they are much affected with hope and false comfort. But as these things die away, their old lusts revive, and they by degrees return like the dog to his vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. They return to their sensual practices, to their worldly practices, to their proud and contentious practices, as before. And no wonder this makes them forsake their closets. Sinning and praying agree not well together. If a man be constant in the duty of secret prayer, it will tend to restrain him from willful sinning. So, on the other hand, if he allow himself in sinful practices, it will restrain him from praying. It will give quite another turn to his mind, so that he will have no disposition to the practice of such a duty. It will be contrary to him. A man who knows that he lives in sin against God will not be inclined to come daily into the presence of God, but will rather be inclined to fly from his presence, as Adam, when he had eaten of the forbidden fruit, ran away from God and hid himself among the trees of the garden. To keep up the duty of prayer after he hath given loose to his lusts would tend very much to disquiet a man's conscience. It would give advantage to his conscience to testify aloud against him if he should come from his wickedness into the presence of God immediately to speak to him. His conscience would, as it were, fly in his face. Therefore hypocrites, as they by degrees admit their wicked practices, exclude prayer. Fifth. Hypocrites never counted the cost of perseverance in seeking God and of following Him to the end of life. To continue instant in prayer with all perseverance to the end of life requires much care, watchfulness, and labor. For much opposition is made to it by the flesh, the world, and the devil, and Christians meet with many temptations to forsake this practice. He that would persevere in this duty must be laborious in religion in general. But hypocrites never count the cost of such labor, i.e., they never were prepared in the disposition of their minds to give their lives to the service of God and to the duties of religion. It is therefore no great wonder if they are weary and give out after they have continued for a while, as their affections are gone, and they find that prayer to them grows irksome and tedious. Sixth, hypocrites have no interest in those gracious promises which God hath made to his people, of those spiritual supplies which are needful in order to uphold them in the way of their duty to the end. God hath promised to true saints that they shall not forsake him. Jeremiah 32, verse 40. I will put my fear into their hearts, that they shall not depart from me. He hath promised that he will keep them in the way of their duty. 1 Thessalonians 
5, verses 23 and 24. And the God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. But hypocrites have no interest in these and such like promises, and therefore are liable to fall away. If God do not uphold men, there is no dependence on their steadfastness. If the Spirit of God depart from them, they will soon become careless and profane, and there will be an end to their seeming devotion and piety. End of section 24